Watch that right there on the floor. Tim, you see this? I was anxious to put distance between me and this place, Central State. But I had this feeling that I had opened up some mystic doorway, not knowing who or what would serendipitously come through from the other side. Often places familiar in the present seem to resonate with the past. Emotions imprinted in bricks and mortar, steel and cloth, waiting for some human igniter to release its energy. What are these places that hold these souls in time? What veil do spirits pierce to communicate? What force drives them? Is it to comfort or something more sinister? The classic battle of good and evil waged on the spiritual plane. What are these tales, these ghost stories, and are we truly forever walking with the dead? When a person dies, there's a process that they go through that is similar to the process of going to sleep, that they withdraw their attention from the physical body, from the physical senses, and we call it withdrawal. They withdraw from the physical body or the physical form. An awful lot of people can be slightly, um, to put it lightly, it can be the mind. The mind is like a fascinating thing. Right here, it starts right over there, and then it comes right here. Um, you, you find different things, and as you, again, peel away the layers, it explains why this was here, why did they do this. Uh, you find paint colors, you find clues of uh, what used to be. One of the spirits has nothing to do with the movie theater. It has to do with <clears throat> the original courthouse that was here, the original purpose and intent of this building other than, so I'm having to separate out what <clears throat> the intention and purpose of this land, because there's a layering of energy in the way I perceive things. And that's actually a part of what we teach is to become what we call a whole functioning self, which is being able to be aware of existence in all levels of consciousness simultaneously. There's a very popular lady by the name of Irene Petro who was uh, known as lovingly as the popcorn lady and manned the concession stand for many, many years. And after uh, Irene passed, a new set of workers came in and, uh, and were working the concession stand. And as they had all of their popcorn buckets stacked up, they turned to go and do something else and all of the popcorn buckets blew off the counter. So they assumed it was just some breeze or whatever and restacked them and it happened again. It's trance, so there's different states that you can actually send your body into. So you don't go and meet them, basically they come and meet you. And it's what we call a blending. It's a blending of spirit, our spirit with their spirit. And there's almost like a guardian that stands with this original place. Has not been anything bad or negative. There's a playful spirit that keeps following me. When we were downstairs, I, when we first went downstairs, I felt something brush my hair and tap me, but it wasn't a negative spirit. I've come across very, very few what you would class as evil spirits. A lot of spirits will bang, knock, throw things because they want attention. You know, they're attention-seeking. 
you can sense a presence. This was a theater in 1922. Something was here. They did, you know, who knows what went on. Yeah. I felt children. Well, we heard a, like a baby crying earlier, right? Especially when you're cleaning the theater uh, by yourself. I've several times felt like there was somebody next to me going to say something to me. And I turned to look for one of my colleagues. And, and there's nobody there. What happens with most people is that those worlds are very separate. When the truth is, we all exist with many different dimensions of consciousness, it's just that we're not aware of them. So what's your circle? What have you heard about it? Area supposedly used by black witches those dabbling in the black arts. Seances on uh, Halloween or uh, full moon nights. Okay, like tonight? Mm-hmm. Okay. It is multidimensional. It has seven levels. And I think the experience that most people are the most familiar with is the relationship between waking state and sleeping state. That when somebody goes to sleep, they're not dead. However, they're not aware of what's going on around them physically if they're in a deep state of sleep. So it's not that there's anything wrong with their sense of sight or hearing, but they're not aware of the sights and sounds around them. And they're alive and they exist in a different realm or a different dimension. Not seen anything yet. millimeter camera on a tripod. I had high high speed film. I had a thousand speed film. Set my 35 millimeter camera because we knew somewhere here was the issue. Thermal scanner and was just walking around in this general vicinity like this taking readings and about that time of night it was about again around 51 degrees. 51, 55, I mean, we went up to 60 on a couple of them, which is pretty normal, That there's gonna be variances. And then she's walking along, and she's about right in here, and she, 20 degrees, 15 degrees. What you have to do is look at the phenomena behind the haunting. How can you have a pocket of 20 degrees when everything around you in the entire universe is 51 degrees, 55 degrees. That's not normal. And that's what the study's all about. When you find an abnormality, you take a picture. So when she's reading these readings, I took a picture. When a person dies, there's a process that they go through that is similar to the process of going to sleep. They withdraw their attention from the physical body, from the physical senses, they withdraw from the physical body or the physical form. I took several pictures that night. Most of them were absolutely nothing in them. Two of them had two orbs. There are attachments that they still have, particularly emotional attachments, either to a person or to a place that they stay entrapped, kind of bound to either a particular place or a particular person. One of them, right here, and it's hard to see when you first look at the picture. It's hard to see. In fact, I overlooked it until somewhat well. I said, well, I didn't get anything that night. This area right here for some reason. I was disappointed because I looked through the pictures and didn't see a darn thing. And the person looking at the pictures, well, what about this one right here? What about those two women walking in the graveyard? And I said, what two women? These spirits seem to be locked in a moment, perhaps on the way to some important event, interrupted by the tragic twist of fate. And it's kind of funny, the two prior pictures that I took with the orbs were underneath this tree right here, but there were two of them, two orbs. And then when the picture finally came out, the two ladies. Is this a message for the living or purgatory for the dead? I don't know, you know, I could speculate. I do know that people tend to draw to them what is a match for the kind of thinking they have. Now when you get into an evil spirit, it will maybe perhaps start 
has those type of things, but it will progress and get into things that go way beyond that type of phenomenon. There's one that looks like a lady, then you remember seeing that one I told you it looked like a mother? Yes. The thing that I'm being bothered with right now is um, infiltration in the phone system. So people who tend to be afraid are kind of a magnet for people who feed on that. Yeah, because I got eight, almost 18 hours worth of recording on here. Okay. And a lot of the mind can be brought into this in areas where you go in and you find me as a medium will go into and they say they're being possessed or the house is possessed. A lot of it is actually them being open to spirit, which means that um, they've basically opened their own doorway. The common connections with spirits can be sensory, auditory, or visual. Is it? Is it? Is it recording? And you'll hear it all change. It's okay. You will hear anything now. Um, what? What did you say? Did you say? See, she's oh, talking. Okay. They're talking, but it's not him. But I thought it was him, but it was not. I was hearing them talk. And so then I say, What did you say? And he said, I said nothing. And here it was them yeah. talking, but at the time I couldn't understand them. So you don't go and meet them, basically they come and meet you and it's what we call a blending. It's a blending of spirit, our spirit with their spirit. It's as if the animal can smell or feel the fear of the person and so they attack them. Are you fear? This is going to sound crazy, but so if you're afraid of a ghost, and the ghost might like, come after you more or something, or no? Uh, possibly. Because it's an attraction kind of thing. Right, right. I don't know what he's saying. I mean, it's foreign language to me. I don't know. I mean, and again, it's discipline. It's discipline with this as to how much the sitter, the trance sitter that's sitting, allows that person to come forward. Uh, full trance would be totally overtaken where the person would actually stand up, I think would be of the spirit that came into that person. When a person becomes empathic, they begin to act like a host for those on the other side, a conduit for entities or spirits usually intercepting messages. But as it accelerates, the empathic host can take on the emotions and feelings of these spirits, and in some ways become controlled by them. Unexplained vocalizations progressed over the years, getting louder, and some gradually more understandable, as if the spirits were learning how to communicate with her. But this was not friendly chit-chat. This was an angry spirit out to harm in any way it could. Judy has reported grey mists in the house, doors slamming, and has even been badly scratched by something that still lingers in this world. She had an entire wall dedicated to the documentation of her encounters with these spirits, categorised by name, type and event. And I thought, well, if they're going to disturb my life, why shouldn't I tell? And to pinpoint, there's so many on here, I, you know, like, for example, that one. Okay. So that's where, like, most really good trance mediums will sit with one particular person. Like I said to you earlier, like, I have a nice English gentleman called Nigel. He sits with me all the time. And because he comes in, he goes out when I ask him to, he's got a very good, um, if you like, he's able to use my voice box better. It says here, the recording gave proof of the evil spirit of being in control. He was giving commands to others what he wants and would now allow of being told no. Again, you have the law of attraction and the law of invitation. 
when they come in these places and try, well, let's go out to the cemetery and do the Ouija board or whatever, the seance, because they think they're going to draw a spirit out of here, and they end up drawing something that's not a spirit, and that's how a lot of cemeteries get haunted and stuff. You know, if you remember, she talked about small rotted flesh. Yeah. That's a sign of a inhuman spirit. Inhuman, inhuman spirit. I went back to the audio clip that she'd played for me earlier that was unintelligible. I still felt like there was something there, so I slowed it down. Still nothing. And then I reversed it. Does this recording seem to say murder? In further conversation with Judy, it was revealed that a murder-suicide had taken place in the house. A distraught, crazed husband killing his wife and daughter and then hanging himself in the living room. Recently, Judy demolished the old structure and erected a new home. She had hopes that things would be gone, but the hauntings got worse, unleashing even stronger energy when the earth filtering the deep for 150 years was disrupted. It's a small spirit. How do you know when to take these photographs? You just feel like? Uh, when I would go out, I could feel and I could tell where they was at. Can you feel that now? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I can tell where they're at. But are they here in the, in the house or are they outside? They're outside now. They used to be in the house, but they're out. They're not no more because they're not allowed. When people commit an act, terrible act like murder, something that is considered uh, a real bad sin. Sometimes that can attract uh, an evil spirit. They are not allowed in the house. They tried, but they back off. There's a man right here, see, and his arm goes up and he's holding something. Mm -hmm. Let's, for instance, say that a home where a murder took place, that the spirit of the person who was murdered is there uh, because of the phenomena occurring. And in reality, it's an evil spirit that was attracted by the act that is in the home, pretending to be the spirit of the murder victim. See, and his arm goes up and he's holding something. And it does that to gain your sympathy, your compassion for it to uh, get a foothold on you and then uh, once it's done that it kind of works its way into your life and then you got real problems oh my god and these are not anything that you've manipulated or touched oh no uh -uh, just quite so you don't know about photoshop probably or anything like that no i just use my digital camera and i go where i feel what judy revealed next at first looked like nothing more than a glitch in the image but this glitch or distortion did have shape. Like most of the things encountered on this journey, when spirits pierce the veil to this world, it often starts as a subtle peek through from the other side. But I thought, until Mike here showed me, I know that's his mouth and his chin, but there's no, that looks like a flagpole, but there's no flagpole on that property. Hmm. There's none. There's no paint on the building or anything? No, but the thing it is, I thought these were eyes, but it's not. It's his nose. If you look real careful, there's an eye there and an eye there. When I took this picture, he was not fully developed. Could they have wolf. disrupted the soil, releasing this creature into the present? So he was not fully developed there. And then the next picture, it all changes. Flagpole gone, and now this is sitting there. Oh, okay. And that's all gone. And now. Is that a tree or anything like that? Or? No. It is as if the entity, as it materializes, turns to seek out its host turning to the camera, turning to Judy. Mm -hmm. 
Judy believes it is the land that is haunted and any structure on the land will become haunted also. Uh, I, I, I'm just really careful, you know. You know, you can let up your guard and get yourself in trouble. But these spirits are not stupid, and, you know. So they'll, they'll play games with your head. I can feel spirits outside. They're not inside. But what they're trying to figure out and what they're curious about is you. They're wanting to find out what you got and what you're doing. You might feel something brush up against you, but they're going to leave Mike alone. They're going to leave her alone. You're the person. You're the one. I wanted to find out more about what Judy had captured with her camera. I had seen that image before in some obscure textbook on mythology. Azazel is represented in the Book of Enoch as the personification of wickedness. He revealed to the people the secrets of witchcraft and corrupted their manners. When I took this picture, he was not fully developed. Our world is filled with spirits. There are the evil spirits, and then there are those very good spirits. Because the truth is, none of us is alone. We're always connected with each other. I mean, what every person thinks affects everybody else. Hello? Not all spirits mean us harm. There are those that protect and comfort. It's very real to experience something that's beyond the physical body, that we all have an influence on each other, that um, there's a certain responsibility in that as well as a, a kind of comfort in it, I think. named Tuckaway uh, when it was enlarged by Mr. and Mrs. George Philip Meyer in 1910. Here in this place, the energy was welcoming and warm. There, it was a friend's book club and there were tons of people. And I, I knew nothing about the house, what the house was about. It's because it is tucked away in a forest of trees. But sometime during the night, I'd come upstairs to use the restroom. Three o'clock in the morning is the spiritual hour. And I was standing over there at the landing. Was once considered to be an Indian burial ground and a holy place. And I remember looking up around here on this wall, and I, I started feeling like, just very light-headed. This was a salon in the Midwest where artists, writers, actors, playwrights, movie stars, scientists. I felt like I was in a different time period or something. All of a sudden, I got the biggest chill that I've ever felt in my life. My friend Jennifer walked out of the restroom and she said, what, you know, what was that? I said, I don't know, I just felt this chill go through my back and out my front. And she said, That's, that was Nellie. She became a palmist, and she read people's hands. Born in 1862, and she started working for her church at church bazaars in the summer, dressed as a gypsy. She told many people of wondrous things that happened. Childless uh, people were told they were going to have children, and they did. She predicted many things, because it's true, any change you have in your life on a mental, spiritual, physical, emotional realm will show up in a, as a line on the palm of the hand. With research and continuing practice, she became a great reader of hands. She was sworn to secrecy when she read the president's hands and the first lady's hands frequently at the White House. That would have been uh, Franklin Roosevelt. 
This is the library. And this is where Mrs. Meyer read the poems of the famous clientele. A formal request from the Library of Congress asking for Nellie's work. Franklin Roosevelt and his wife, Eleanor, asked that 137 autographed photographs be placed in the Library of Congress on permanent display. She was often a guest in the White House. This was no 900 psychic. This woman treated her art as a science. And she helped the FBI figure uh, the science of fingerprinting. She had two secretaries just to handle her daily correspondence. It's very scientific, the hand. The left hand is the past or your potential, and your right hand is what you're doing with it, unless you're opposite hand oriented. And when I feel her energy, I mean, she's, she's showing me something. Lots of tears were shed in this room. Lots of laughter was in this room. Great secrets, great world secrets. It's very interesting. I believe that when she spoke to the political people, it's like the ancient oracles, where people, the people that were heads of state would come and ask the oracle. But this was a different time and a different place. This was like the modern day, at the turn of the century oracle. And people sought her as an advisor and took her quite seriously. She didn't uh, promote anything of the Delphic or the psychic ever because it would have a negative connotation. She considered what she did a science, an exacting science, and she wrote a best-selling book in 1939 called Lion's Paws, about the paws of the lions of society. The articles of the day said that they had the greatest collection of friends to be found anywhere in the world, and I, I, I don't think that's an exaggeration. My profound gratitude to Mrs. Meyer from Joan Crawford, Walt Disney, Famous choreographer, School of Dance, Ruth Page. Miss Page has bothered to write me a dozen times about the significance of Tuckaway. Rudy Valley, Doug Fairbanks Jr. Rachmaninoff gave a concert here in 1941 in this room. Walt Disney gave uh, uh, original cartoons drawn by him to her. This is the last house Carol Lombard was ever in in her life, and this is the last photograph she left with Mrs. Meyer before her death. She was warned at that door of impending danger. She was here on a war bond drive, spoke to many thousands of people from the circle. She didn't heed Mrs. Meyer's warning. She took a flight out to L.A. that afternoon, and it crashed, and she was killed. One of the most glamorous, and from Indiana as well, from Fort Wayne. There is no linear time in this home. It's truly, when you walk in this house, you're in present time. The past, present, future happen all at one time. And that's the beauty. That's the most absolute beauty of this home. And this house loves parties. This is a place for people to gather. It's like a Paris salon. Albert Einstein came to this house, a skeptic, according to the press of the day, and left with a certain sense of wonder. I think the entire house is haunted. I'm even afraid to go to the basement, Dan, at 3 o'clock in the morning. No way. 3 o'clock in the morning is the spiritual hour. Yeah, no, it was like something came in from behind you know, me. No, I don't ever mess down. with... No. We agreed to meet here, and I took her arm, and we strolled around the house. She pulled some pictures out of the interiors taken in 1922. She was embarrassed by the condition of it, and she wanted to check me out. Well, finally, she produced two keys, and we walked in this, these double doors together. But it felt like I was entering another time zone. There were trunks and boxes in it. And it was all about to go to the trash if I hadn't gotten here right at the 11th hour. A very important piece of Indiana history would have, been, would have disappeared. A woman's entire life is here in papers and photographs. She passed away here in 1944. I did rent rooms for almost three decades, but oftentimes ghost stories would happen to people who never met, who were from different parts of the world, but they would repeat the same thing. So there was almost a scientific feel to my life. Sightings. Um, for years, we saw Mr. Meyer standing at the top of the stairs in a white linen suit. He wore and used a monocle, which hung around his neck. He had a white mustache. I mean, everybody saw him. 
then he seemed to disappear after a while. I'm very social, I have lots of parties. My father is, uh, was a pilot in World War II and he doesn't even believe in ghosts. He saw him. One bedroom belonged to Mrs. Meyer and later to her niece Ruth, who, who sold me the house. It was the hardest to rent. Several people experienced the same phenomenon. One girl felt paralyzed while all the bed sheets were pulled out from underneath her and danced around the room, only to wake in horror the next morning and find the bed clothes draped all around the room. I was watching TV on this floor and one young man appeared at two o'clock in the morning and said, I can't stand it anymore. And I said, what do you mean? He says, well, there's a face in the ceiling and it winked at me and then somebody said, hey, I think the entire house is haunted. It's a feeling, that's all I can explain. It can be a very welcoming home, but it's, it can be moody too. I walked in this room and saw like the whole room I thought was a fire because uh, it was so misty, like smoke, and it wasn't smoke. When the house is babysat whenever I'm out of town, I have another property on the coast on an island. <laughs> Anybody staying here, and there always is somebody here, they call me up in the middle of the night and they tell me what they're perceiving. And it's the same thing. We hear cocktail music. We hear the piano being played. Nellie Simons Meyer made her international reputation reading palms. And the home in which she resided continues to radiate her presence. Images of her have been seen by many not in a threatening way, but as a signal of comfort and warmth. I closed down February 12th, uh, 1992 was my last day of op uh, operation. Once a bustling hub of entertainment and laughter, it now stands silent, but for one voice. But after my son had committed suicide, um, May 17th, 1992, I kind of threw the towel in. I didn't feel much like doing anything. I was in bed for three years. My friends picked me up to take me grocery shopping, and I had to feed the cats. I didn't have as many cats then as I have now. I had, I think I had seven cats. I lost 42 pounds in a very short time, but I stayed in bed for three years. The home of happiness. That's how Carl Lemmy Jr., president of Universal Pictures, described the Rivoli Theater in 1927. As the theatre sits empty, the sound of one man's footsteps echo within its crumbling walls. Charlie stands vigil over the once grand theatre, still hopeful that it will be resuscitated. In the house. Believe you me, it's a job, it's a task cave with 31 cats I have. There's nine next door. There's a few that I haven't named yet. They're other personality traits. The last patron has long since exited, save for one, Lady Rivoli, a spirit Charlie sees regularly, appearing in the first few rows of the theatre, as if waiting for the start of the picture show. Jonas Chrysostomus Wolfgangus Theophilus Mozart was his name. Believe it or not, 
by Charlie Chilton. Well, uh, I was at the Rewind bench, as I am right now. Uh, I saw in my peripheral vision um, the lady who was uh, my administrative assistant also lived in the building. And uh, I asked her for my yellow handle screwdriver. And she didn't get the screwdriver that I asked for. And I, I, I put the unit down and I turned around and she was gone. I said, to Sarah, my administrative assistant, you were standing right next to me. Uh, I asked for the, the yellow handle screwdriver. Why didn't you give it to me? And she said, Charles, I never left the house. And as I thought about it, I never heard the projection booth door open or close. Uh, I, I, I saw her as, as clearly then as I can see you, Dan, in my peripheral vision holding the camera in your hand. What is amazing about Charlie is his gift of recalling details to the second in the grain. His wit is sharp, his mind sound, making his tales of the hauntings even more compelling. Every night at precisely 3 o'clock. If you look at this, this is a face. Photographs began to come forward. The spirit, the spirit makes itself known. There's a definite face right here. This mist often takes on human form. The first day of operation was um, October 15th, 1975. It was, uh, the building was constructed by Universal Studios, uh, opened uh, September 15th, 1927. From its opening, strange occurrences have been reported. So this is where you see Lady River. She comes back to the theater. She, um, she has a tendency to always emerge from the right side of the auditorium. A, a, a vague form of a lady begins to appear just before 3 o'clock in the morning. That exact time, there's something in the auditorium also moves. Charles Richard Chiltier, the first, the last, and the only one. Thank God for that. And where are we now? What, what we are at the Rivoli Theater on East 10th and Dearborn, between Dearborn and Gray Street, 3155 East 10th. The building was constructed in 1925, finished, open for business September 15th, 1927. Constructed for Universal Studios under the auspices of Carl Lamell Jr., who was the producer of the first Frankenstein film and the first Dracula film. When I hired a cashier, if the building did not like the cashier for one reason or another. The hot water faucet in the in the mop room turned off by itself. By itself. If you turned it on, it would turn off by itself. Mm -hmm. When the cashier was gone, it was just fine. Mm -hmm. Alright. Yeah, Wait, we're gonna have right. I don't know how to get the cats back in the house once they're on the building and I heard stories from those who, who worked in this building in the late 20s and came in as uh, and or came in as patrons in the 30s. I thought they were a little off the wall. They were not playing with a full deck until I experienced it myself. Another interesting thing is that everybody who was in this building, including Universal Studios, had problems with maintenance. Everybody. Everybody. They could not get anything repaired except yours truly. Another face of uh, Yes, yes. There's faces. There's here's the eyes, here's the nose, here's the mouth. You have to see it. There's a definite face right here. I think what she's telling me is that the people or spirits that are here don't mind us being here. No, no, not at and all. They, want, they actually want us and they want the communication with us. All right, <clears throat> let's try. But you must remember, 
She loves one person and one person only. And I never mock her. One other thing you have to remember is that she has to have access to everything down here. When we're down here, right. we're occupying the space she right. might want to, yes, want to traverse. Exactly. Every night at precisely 3 o'clock. You don't think that it's going to be a problem if we just set the cameras up? Well, the spirit, the spirit makes itself known. It's not a physical problem. If, if, if you expect to see what you want to see, then everything should be upstairs. Yes, Charlie. You don't, you don't see me touching anything, do you? That's I'm pretty weird. Right here. No, no. Nobody's touching it, right? No. As the investigation team set up the remote infrared camera, a specialized unit for recording in low light conditions, an electrical phenomenon occurred, a foreshadowing of events ahead. Nobody's touching it, right? Yeah. Charlie? No. About, about 15 seconds before 3 o'clock, there's a, a form that begins to develop. A form. A form. It's a haze that begins to develop on the, on the right side of the auditorium. Auditorium right. With the remote in place, the goal was to gain access to the auditorium for evidence. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, yes. The team was being led by an incredible urge to see this phenomenon firsthand. As we moved further into the auditorium, it was like we had found the sunken hulk of the Titanic. In the distance, in the lobby of this once grand palace, was the outline of a rusting automobile. I've seen her. About six rows from the front. It's a haze that begins to develop on the, on the right side of the auditorium. Auditorium right. Was this here in the same tradition as the House of Blue Lights, a coffin for Lady Rivoli? Had the team discovered something grislier than they expected? Precisely three o'clock in the morning. Precisely three when the second end is at twelve. You can see the outline of a lady. And then a few seconds after that, it collapses completely. But while while it's intact, there's a noise in the There's something in the auditorium also also moves. Well, at least you can hear it. And then, as if to say enough, Charlie ended the search for the lady. And if I'm lying to you, my tongue should be cut from my mouth, I from my head. I can if feel I'm you. lying to you, I, I, my, my, my fingers should go paralyzed in the next five years. No one knows, only the spirit. Have we witnessed the spirit of Lady Rivoli? or simply moonbeams piercing through holes in the crumbling roof of this once magnificent structure. That's her arm, and there's an arm, her head. Why does she appear here at the same time and place? I'll tell you where she's buried. On the west side of the building, close to the sidewalk. There's one casket still in this ground. This was an old Indian burial ground. This city had many Indian burial grounds. It was an Indian city, like many cities throughout the entire nation. And she likes me. I've seen her. Nothing really can be proven. Nothing. The only absolutes are death and the speed of light. Everything else can be disputed. Everything. Even the spirit can be disputed. What was great and magnificent is now on its last stand against the elements. And safe for human habitation, the Rivoli breathes its last breath.
so tomorrow you can say what a lovely yesterday. An imp is a demon from hell. I can feel spirits outside. They're not inside. But what they're trying to figure out and what they're curious about is you. They're wanting to find out what you got and what you're doing. But they don't like what you're doing. They like it here. They're going to leave Mike alone. They're going to leave her alone. You're the person. You're the one. What's up, man? You took the back How are you? Badget, Mary. Oh, it's nice to see you. This is Dale. Uh, Hi. Okay. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Owner of the jail. That's what I've heard. I'm, I'm very curious about this now. We are too. And after you and we your had brother last live there. Yep. I understand. Up there is day 1879. Uh, when the jails were built back, back then, um, the sheriff usually lived in the jail. So the front part of the jail is usually a, a um, living quarters, and then in the back, the jail cell area. Put the prisoner in, and then the, that way they can't uh, they can't jump out when you open the door. In areas where you go in and you find me as a medium will go into, and they say they're being possessed or the house is possessed. A lot of it is actually them being open to spirit, which means that um, they've basically opened their own doorway, and as easy, an easy way of doing that is using, you know, like a crystal ball, tarot cards, just messing around. They can actually open a doorway up. The, the people would say, you know, hey, we'd be glad to, to uh, spend the night here, and uh, they never, they never would do it. We've known that um, there has been people that's hung themselves. In fact, one night I, I um, stopped a guy from hanging himself, so I know there's there's been people that's hung themselves in here. And... It has been said that the closer you get to the spirit world, the more present time seems to blend with nature. Things that seemed odd now feel normal. You ever get a, you ever move around up here and all of a sudden get this really close claustrophobic feeling sometimes, that's the other side. Awareness is heightened and light bends and distorts with the mist of those wanting connection with the living. The ghosts, yeah. That's what I'm hearing. We'll lock them up if they... <laughs> with the one that said cry baby? Yes. Oh, okay. Air takes on weight and a sort of reverent silence becomes the sound. Has there ever been a fire in this building? No. Whew. It's like a really fiery spot right there. The minute I came up and stepped and where it made the noise, it's like a cinder flew in my eye. It's like really weird, like a it's really hot energy. It was just an assault energy. That's what it felt like the second I came up the stairs. There, there's strong impressions in here. There's really strong impressions in here. Troll. It's almost like an impish troll type energy. It's like a, I don't know what it is, it's a, it's a real, it's coming from down, way down under. Well, there's been many people held in here who's, there, there's strong impressions in here. Touch that bar. Touch right in there. That's well, just vibrating. It's just totally vibrating. That's wild. It's like an electrical charge. Yeah. Yeah. 
There's so much energy of people. Okay, picking up. 1930, 31. It's almost like a, a, a bad boy wannabe, like a like a baby face Nelson mm -hmm. type of person was in here. John Dillinger and his gang was in here back in the 30s. That glamorous kind of, they glad yeah. to get hold of yeah. something. I feel like he's trying to not take me over, but, you know, make me feel what he feels. So, okay, you become me. You feel this. Do it. And I don't want that. And I get a combination of people standing there looking out, wanting to be free, to people being chained there. I think this is what I was pulling from down in the very bottom. He's getting angry. Sorry. You okay? No. Yeah. <laughs> that was horrible. <laughs> what he felt. Is he still bothering you? Wow. Did you feel it go by you? Yeah. Whew. Yeah. Energy that's stirred up. Yeah, there, there's three or four levels of things going on. Very strong. <sighs> we ask this shaft of light to go deep down to the center of the Mother Earth and cleanse and heal this level of this energy. As if on instinct, Marilyn begins to pray for protection and healing. And whatever is coming up from the underground, what was this energy that was released? We ask this shaft of light to go deep down to the center of the Mother Earth and cleanse and heal this level of this energy. It was just an assault energy. That's what it felt like the second I came up the stairs. They're still telling me no, get out. And what's, whatever's feeding off of the pain and the suffering and the trapped fear, fearful energy that was in here, is what's saying no. When you're, when you, especially when you live in a vibration like this, it can come over, it can overcome you at weak moments. I had a sense that we should leave then, but there was, there was something. something more that was pulling them down deeper into this place of confinement. And seemingly, another spirit answers. This place had felt as if it was holding more than the memories of those who chose to turn on society, as if to shackle the souls who have spent their last breathing moments in this place, only to be heard once again by the living. Very secure place. It's the walls are solid granite. What did you just say? I'm getting that pungent smell. That smell followed, and now it's back down here. No, you don't have to come. This reminds me of the room in Central State where we saw the We saw the pictures on the wall, and we saw the metal bed, and we saw it's the same bad energy. It's the same thing. Yeah, it's the same thing. There's death in here. This is a place. It's not just like despair. It's a place of, of death.
There's at least three people, it feels like, that died in here, that expired, that actually died. It's like an impish troll type energy. It's like a, I don't know what it is. It's a, it's a real. You still be my bodyguard? Um, let me get. <laughs> you got my back. Yeah. It's this whole side of the building again that's got something going on over here. Yeah, it turns. Clark, carry in. Where does it go turn into? We don't know. Then it turns and goes go back to the other end. It's all hollow. Wow. Really? So yeah, from there on over. So wow. and we can't we can't find a way in. So what do you mean you can't find a way in where? Well, I mean they go said, well, they can't have people like in a dungeon anymore and they can't have people Unexplained audio interference seems to signal an encounter with the spirit world. No, 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 guys, no, 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 and then the EVP commanding. It was just an assault energy. It was just an assault. Temporarily recovering and on her way out, she is attacked again. the energy that Marilyn sensed earlier. All the time we worked together, I had never seen Tracy use his holy water. Even though it would be weeks before the footage was analyzed, that human sense of danger was on full alert. A few months later, medium Larry Brown consented to a trance and was asked what was experienced by the team in the dungeon of the Hartford City Jail. For what you have encountered and what you have seen is what 
we class as familiars. Nature's power. These are Earth energies, the dark times. An imp would be an accomplice. They would protect their chosen, their chosen one. He protects that which was condemned. That person who would have been condemned. I, friend, may I say this is only the beginning. your journey